to our very special event tonight. This, of course, is one in a series of talks that we have where we have really distinguished faculty colleagues come in and share with you the sorts of things that get them excited. Sort of what really makes the heart of a faculty member be faster in a whole range of fields, be it the humanities, the sciences, the arts, or the social sciences. So tonight it gives me particular pleasure to introduce a colleague and friend that for me has been very important in terms of bringing knowledge and awareness of Korea to Harvard. I first actually met David McCann in the context of a study abroad program that he did in Korea where he took Harvard students over to Korea and gave them an experience of that country in Seoul specifically. But I have a sort of a long list of things about um, David that I'd like to share with you because I think it really illustrates how deeply embedded he is in understanding Korea and in particular um, Korean poetry which we're fortunate enough to hear about from a real master and expert um, in that area. So Professor David McCann is the Korea Foundation Professor of Korean Literature in the Department of East Asian Languages and, and Civilizations and is also the director of the Korea Institute at Harvard. So he has really a leadership role in terms of allowing Harvard to connect with Korea very deeply. He's an accomplished scholar and author, and his books include Amazalias, I'm Enough to Say It's Far, the, Colum the Columbia Anthology of Modern Korean Poetry, and Early Korean Literature, Selections and Introductions. David is also a renowned poet whose work has been published in such distinguished journals as Poetry, Plowshares, and Rules. Finally, and unsurprisingly, he is the recipient of numerous prizes, grants, and fellowships, including the Order of Cultural Merit Award in 2006, which is one of the highest decorations awarded by the Korean government. So tonight, I think we are very fortunate and that David is here to spend time with us and to share with us his insight into that remarkable form of Korean poetry known as Sijo, what he describes as the new haiku. So please join me in welcoming David Makan. Thank you all so much, and Rob, thank you for that, that warm introduction. Uh, this is my first time here. And it's just so much fun to see what a wonderful space this is. And I can imagine all kinds of folks of all ages using it. And I think I'll come over here more often, uh, get away a little bit from, from the Harvard Square area. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the Shicho. And it's um, something that I'm sort of comparing to the haiku, uh, because a lot of people, at least in this country are familiar with the haiku, the Japanese verse form, 17 syllables, and usually, but not always, something about, about nature. And I teach a class called Writing Asian Poetry, and the students in the class uh, start off by reading some translations of some of the classic Tang Dynasty Chinese poets, especially uh, two named Li Bo, and Du Fu, and trying to understand what their poems were like, and then reading some translations of their poems. And then instead of writing a big academic paper about it, what we do is we write poetry. And I've just gone through the first folio of materials that that class has put together. And for the first time, didn't get 100% papers. I got a blog posted, and two really amazing pieces of artwork uh, with the poems, uh, just some amazing things that the students are doing, and they kind of keep me on my toes as I'm trying to figure out uh, you know, what we're going to do next. But a couple of years ago, we were talking about the next part of the class, which goes to the haiku. And it turned out that all of the students who had gone to school in the US in fourth or fifth grade had had an introduction to the haiku and they'd heard something about what it is, and they'd learned something about Japanese history and culture. And what I realized was it gave them all a sense of some familiarity with Japan more broadly. And then also some familiarity with that haiku form. 
And I thought, if haiku, then why not shijo for Korea? It might be a great way to sort of introduce Korea and its culture to the schools in the United States and give a kind of different view of Korea. Um, everybody knows about Korea's huge industrial output and the shipyards at Ulsan and the financial success. Uh, the cars, the Hyundai uh, and, and others were familiar with that. Uh, but there's a wonderful culture in Korea. And that's something that I'd like more people in our country to, to know about and to understand. And for quite a while, um, as the class went on through the spring semester, I was thinking about Shijo, Shijo, Shijo. How can we do Shijo? And I write poetry, as Rob mentioned. I started writing poetry when I was in high school. Uh, a friend of mine in 10th grade said, Dave, you ever heard of poetry? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, you know, you can write something without saying it straight out. You can sort of hide it. And I thought, that sounds like fun. <laughs> and I started writing when I was in high school. And uh, I just have to add now, one of the great uh, pleasures of that was I had a wonderful English teacher in 10th grade. And she was head of the English department over at Newton High School. And she found out about my interest in the poetry. And she said, listen, anytime you feel that you want to be writing a poem and you find study hall too kind of crazy uh, to work on it, she was the chairman and had this big office. And she said, you can just come in and sit at that table and write poetry. And that's what I did. And, and one of the great things that happened in this last week uh, was that my wife and I drove up to New Hampshire, where she now lives, and visited with her. And she's 93 years old, and just the most amazing person. And she was glad to hear about my work on this sheet show, that I've you know, gotten to something serious after all these years. Uh, but anyway, Shijo, 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 I was thinking. And then one day I was at my favorite restaurant in this area. It's a little place in Harvard Square called Charlie's Kitchen. And I don't know if any of you, how many of you have been to Charlie's Kitchen? Um, I was there one day having lunch, sitting at the table, and I was staring. At that time, there was a lobster tank by the front door, the entrance into the restaurant. I was sitting there at the table and sort of staring at that restaurant. That, Lobster. <coughs> and I thought, gee, and I grabbed a napkin and, and wrote a shicho about those lobsters. And I'll read it in a little while. I'm, I am going to hit you over the head with some of my own poems in a bit. Um, but from that point on, which was about three years ago, <clears throat> until relatively recently, all of my poetry has been written in the shicho form. And I've also done a lot of work with other people in different places, with teachers and students and uh, folks over at Uville House uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, introducing the Shijo and exploring what it's like to write it and discovering that a lot of people find it kind of interesting and, and they like to try it out. I don't know if we'll have time this evening to do that, to let you have a go at, at writing some Shijo. But if you leave here thinking you might want to try it, I hope you'll get in touch with me. Um, I'm on the usual Harvard website. I'd love to hear from you and maybe make a chance uh, later in the spring, when it's even warmer than today, uh, to get together again and, and talk about uh, the Shijo, read some of yours. But the Shijo is a poetic form from Korea that goes back um, at the least until the 13th or 14th century. So it's been around for a long time. And one of the things that's kind of distinctive and interesting about it is that it's written in the Korean language. And what's distinctive about that is that for the longest time, up until the late 19th century, most serious formal poetry in Korea was written in Chinese, according to Chinese patterns of verse, and very much in tune with Chinese ancient examples, like the two people I mentioned 
just a little while ago in my class, Li Bo and Du Fu, from the long ago Tang Dynasty. But at the same time, running through Korean history and its literary practices, its culture, has been this vernacular Korean language tradition. And the Shijo is part of that. And so one of the things that's distinctive about it is that it's in the Korean language. And I'll give you a bad example of that. Um, when I was in Korea originally, I had gone there in the Peace Corps. I was in the first group that went to Korea uh, way back in 1966. And I was teaching at a school, an agriculture and forestry high school in a town southeast of Seoul called Andong. And the teachers at the school loved to go into town and sit and have, it was sort of like uh, what they call, what do they call it, karaoke in Japanese, right? We'd sit around and we'd sing and tell stories and of course have some makgeolli to drink. It's a kind of Korean rice wine. In those days though, there was a curfew and you had to be home by 12 o'clock. And so 11.30, I'd be leaving the downtown and making my way back to the house where I was living in a little rented room out on the outskirts of the town. And I'd be singing and I'd be happily making noise as I walked along. And I'd get out of the town and I'd start going through the rice fields that then surrounded the town of Andong. And on the rice fields there were these narrow paths that you walk along. And you have to be kind of careful, especially late at night. But what was really fun about it was that as I began to get closer and closer to the house where I was living, there were two giant pigs who lived right next to my room. They were huge pigs. They were this tall. They were not little pigs. They were two big pigs. And the pigs would hear me making noise <coughs> as I was getting closer and closer to home. And they'd start making noises to greet me. <laughs> And they'd go, in Korean, they'd say, kui, kui. <laughs> kui, kui, kui. <laughs> Which is like, grunt, grunt, grunt. And so, I had this sort of memory in my mind, a little bit later, in the 1970s, I went back to Korea, and I was working on some research, studying Korean literature. And I was studying, among other things, the Shijo because it's a, a very important part of Korea's literary history. And I was studying it, thinking about it, talking with people about it, and then one day I wrote a shijo in Korean, and that's the first shijo I ever wrote. And it's about my friends the pigs in Andong. And in Korean it goes like this. Harupam Andong Shine Golmok Suljip which in English would be sort of like uh, one night after a tour of those little eating and drinking places downtown in Andong as I was making my way back to the house down those narrow paddy field paths, the pigs grunted, grunted, so are you home? <laughs> That's my little sheep. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first one. Let me show you a little bit more though about the real thing, not, not mine. If I can get this uh, system operating. And this is a little bit of an introduction to Korea's culture and, and some of the 
what I think of as characteristic features of Korea. And I feel so old-fashioned. This is wonderful. <laughs> Pointing. <laughs> Pointing, and I think I could even make it uh, full screen. There we are. There we are. Um, this is a photograph from the year 2000, when the president of South Korea, a man named Kim Dae-jong, he's right here, um, and several people who were his trusted associates in the government and his wife, this is Kim Dae-jung over there. They went up to North Korea, and they met with the head of the North Korean state, a fellow named Kim Jong-il, and had several days of conversations. And it was the first time the head of the South Korean state had had conversations with the head of the North Korean state since the Korean War broke out in 1950, and it lasted until 1953. And it was a terribly devastating war. And the two regimes have been very hostile toward one another in all the periods since that time. And this was a real breakthrough for somebody from the South to go up to the North and, and meet with the head of the North Korean state. Now, looking at the picture, can you see Kim Jong-il, the head of the North Korean state? Which one is he? This guy right there. You're absolutely right. How could you tell? You just could tell. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's in his uniform. And, what's that? He stands out. He does. Yes. Everybody else, or almost everybody else, is dressed in regular civilian clothes, rather nice suits and all the rest of that. Except for this guy. <laughs> standing in back of Mrs. Kim Dae-jung, but somebody from the North Korean military, you can see from this insignia on the cap. And it's, I find very interesting because even the head of the North Korean state is in one way or another kind of under surveillance by the military. It's a, it's a very tricky regime. Um, you'll notice that they are lifting some glasses of wine, as it turns out. And if you've read the newspapers about the head of the North Korean state, you'll know that these huge glasses of wine are crystal, and they are filled with very expensive French wine, because that's what the head of the North Korean state likes. Uh, and this group is about to burst into song. They're about to sing a reunification song. And it's a key moment in the negotiations. And one of the things that I find so interesting about it is this fellow right here is a poet, a very well-known poet in South Korea and internationally. His name is Ko Un, and he's done an amazing bit of writing in his life. Many decades ago, he was in prison in South Korea because he demonstrated and he protested against the South Korean government. The South Korean government put him in solitary confinement. And while he was there, all by himself, thinking, this is really awful. How can I keep myself going? He thought to himself, if I ever get out of here, I'm going to write a poem about everybody I ever met in my whole life. And that's what he did. And it's a collection known as Manin Bo, which means the record Bo of 10,000 Man people in. And it's this wonderful thing to read, because there's just everybody he ever met or heard about in his life. It's about 26 volumes of poetry. And he finally has decided a year ago, that's enough of that. But I think it's just wonderful that at this very important meeting of the heads of state, a poet is there, part of this uh, process. And they're about to sing. Singing is a key part of Korea's culture and history. A Korea map. Um, I find this sort of interesting. And, Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the Korean Peninsula. But 
here is the 38th parallel. And you'll notice it isn't a real parallel. A parallel would go like that across the country at the 38th uh, line. But it's, it's bending to accommodate something of the actual terrain. But it divides the peninsula into a southern and northern state. And that happened right at the end of the Second World War, when the United States was negotiating the terms of the surrender of Japanese forces in the Pacific area. And the Japanese had occupied Korea as a colony from 1910 until 1945. The Russians were up in this area. This is Manchuria, and up there is Russia. Over here is China. And the United States was worried that with the Russian troops so close, they could easily come down and take over the whole peninsula. And so the American negotiator suggested to the Russian negotiator of the terms settling the peace in the Pacific area, why don't you run things down to the 38th parallel? We'll take care of things up to the 38th, and then we'll do that for a year or two and then turn it all over to the main people. And the Russians accepted that idea. What's <coughs> sad about it is that it became permanent. And since 1945, there has been this division. And since 1948, two separate states, north and south, of this line. But I mention all of that to suggest this is a political division. But if you look at the peninsula itself, you'll see all the way down this eastern side of the peninsula, a real big mountain range. And then if you look over here, you can see the greener area. And that's much better land for farming. And so there's a, a a division that's built into the peninsula, but the natural territorial sort of division would be down the center like that. And, and what's so interesting is that despite that sort of shaping of the uh, terrain, the Korean people have really been strongly connected for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's this division uh, that broke it into two separate regimes. Oh, this is one of my favorite things. It's a gold crown. And people wore it way back in what was known as the Shilak Kingdom. It was found in a tomb of one of the kings of the Shila period. And you'll notice that it's gold. And you'll notice that it's got this band around at the base. And then these fairly tall... Uh, figures going up like this, people think somewhat in the shape of antlers, that there might be some kind of animal uh, sort of shape to that that might suggest a connection with the animal kingdom in the belief practices of the Shilla people. But then you'll notice that on these very thin pieces of gold that go up so high, there are all kinds of little things hanging and dangling gold pieces and some uh, precious stones and some wonderful things hanging down like this. And when I look at it, I can't help but think what it would have been like at night at a royal banquet with everything dark. And then you have the lanterns, the lamps, the torches in the, in the banquet hall. And the king wearing this, if he turned and gestured to anybody, there'd be this wonderful, flashing, brilliant coloring of it that just, I think, gives a wonderful sense of the, of the people who lived back then and of how much they enjoyed gathering and being together with one another. These are the three major periods in, in a certain part of Korea's history. Uh, Koguryo was this massive area that extended from the Korean Peninsula up into Manchuria and this part of the Asian mainland. And there's a lot of discussion in scholarly circles about whether the people who lived way back then in the BC and early AD era 
were they Korean or were they Chinese? And Chinese anthropologists think one thing and archaeologists think something else. Um, and then Shilla, where that crown came from, unified Korea. But you'll notice only up to about that 38th parallel. And that was a long time ago, sort of from the 7th to the 10th century. And then Koryo unified the entire peninsula <coughs> up to this point. And it's changed a little bit since then. Uh, but what's interesting about it is that North Korean historians say that it was Koguryo which protected the Korean peninsula from people on the Asian mainland. The Koguryo people were great warriors, and they worked in that difficult mountain terrain very effectively to keep large numbers of troops from ever gaining much of a foothold on the Korean peninsula. The Shilla kingdom down here was in some ways protected by the remnants of the Koguryo kingdom to the north and developed a wonderfully complex, beautiful culture that, among other things, made Buddhism an important part of its religious practices. And then Koryo unified the kingdom under Wangon, the founder of the Koryo dynasty. And it's interesting that North Korean historians will point out this is the first real full unification of the entire peninsula. And they connect that back to Koguryo, and they say it's northern. And they say the Shilla people down in this part of the peninsula never really learned how to fight. <laughs> There's a self-portrait by Yun Lu Sok. Um, and what I think is so interesting about it, well, among other things, the detail but the very strong look right back. He knows we're all looking at him. He knows that. And he's staring right back at us. He doesn't mind. Centuries later, he's just as tough as he was when he painted that picture. This is by Byung Sang Gyuk, a 17th century painter. Very favorite painting. Very much evident. You'll see copies of it on all kinds of things in Korea on all kinds of products, but also you can buy copies of it, reproductions of it, and all the rest. And I think one of the things that's so much fun about it, you can see these two cats, they're sort of looking at each other, and this kitty cat up the tree is saying to this one, I'm up pretty high. And this one is saying, wow. And then they're all thinking about these sparrows up there who are chirping and chirping and chirping. And it's kind of a nice, uh, oh, I don't know, exchange of ideas. The one cat says, am I high enough on this tree? And the fellow down here is thinking, no, because those sparrows are still there. You better go up a little higher. And so there's, I think, an interesting story behind that one. Shin Yung Bok, 18th century, a, a wonderful painting of life out in the countryside. The women are on the swings. They're braiding their hair, they're washing in the stream. But you can also notice some naughty boys over here watching the ladies. And what's curious about it is that Shin Yun Bok, the, the artist who did this painting, I think knew that we would be looking at the ladies having a wonderful time on this beautiful spring day. And in a way, we're like these guys over here. So there's kind of an exchange built into the art in a very interesting way, I think. Um, this was kind of fun. Last summer, the United States ambassador to Korea held a Shijo contest at her royal, not royal, her official residence, not royal. Um, but this, this is Ambassador Kathleen Stevens over here. And that guy, you can probably tell, is me. <coughs> this is the poet who was up there in North Korea. The poet Ko Un, who is somebody I've gotten to know a little bit. And then this is Professor Kwon Yong Min from Seoul National University, a friend of mine. And then this is the poet Ko Un play. And the four of us were the judges for a Shijo contest 
and high school students from the English language academies in Korea all came in and wrote Shijo poems, and they did it in the old style of the Confucian state examinations, where you go in, sit down on the floor, and you'd be given a topic, and you'd write about it, and you can see what the topic was. Oh, and it was a wonderful moment. Ambassador Stevens is herself also a former Peace Corps volunteer. Oh, and I should mention here that this is the wife of a friend of ours and my wife over there on the porch looking at something they find more interesting than this gathering here on the lawn. Um, but I'm hoping that the U.S. Embassy will continue that. Those are the some of the judges and the ambassador. Oh, these are the students writing like crazy. Uh, right on the floor. I figured they do that, which is kind of... All right, let me show you now something about the Shijo, which is what I really <coughs> like. Um, the Shijo has three lines. The first line sort of starts telling or starts showing what's there, what, what the poem is going to be about. And then the second line expands or develops the theme in equal length and power. And then the third line, there's a little twist at the beginning of the third <clears throat> line, and then it resolves itself. So in a way, it's like a four-part poem compressed into just three lines with this twist and then resolution uh, both happening in the third line. There's some syllable counting. Sort of like the shijo, uh, like the haiku, you keep track of syllables. So that in the first line, you have these four parts, going like that. First one, usually three syllables, and then four, and then four or three, four. And then the same thing in the second line. But then when you get this twist in the third line, you have three syllables to start five syllables coming next, and then four, and then three. And so by syllable count, you get sort of a wave effect. And it kind of floats the twist, and then brings the poem to a conclusion. There's some variance, but here's a real shijo. This is by a 16th century Buddhist, not Buddhist, Confucian court government official. His name was Zhong Chol. And you probably know, but if not, that's his family name. And, and Chol is the given name. And here's, here's his Shijo. This is a translation by somebody named Richard Rutt, who's from England. And he was the Anglican bishop in Korea for a number of years, and then rotated back and has been in England now for 15 years or more. But he did a wonderful collection of translation of Korean Shijo. It's called the Bamboo Grove, an introduction to Shijo. And if you're interested, uh, you can find it. But I should mention that way back in the 16th century, uh, the government was trying to assert Confucian practices in government, but also in society. And it was trying to push over to the edges Buddhist practices, which had been part of the Koryo kingdom before. And that'll play out in this particular shijo. And if we read it in English, a shadow strikes the water below. A monk passes by on the bridge. Stay a while, reverend sir. Let me ask where you go. He just points his staff at the white clouds and keeps on his way without turning. So here you have Zhong Chol noticing in the water a shadow. 
and then turning to look, where did it come from? And he sees a monk passing by on the bridge. And then in the second line, it goes like that. Stay a while, reverend sir, let me ask where you go. He calls out to that monk and says, wait a minute, I want to find out where you're going. But the monk <clears throat> just points his staff at the white cloud and goes on his way without turning. It's a very nice picture of these two people and what they were doing. But also, it's this Confucian official government guy with real power in the 16th century kind of challenging the monk a little bit. You had a question? A monk, uh, he's like a minister. And in Buddhism, he's sort of the Buddhist minister. He leads services, and he studies the Buddhist texts, and he teaches people about Buddhism, sort of the way if you go to church, a minister will do, tell you about the Bible, and things like that. <clears throat> it's even better, though, in the original. This is, this is amazing. I should warn you. Fasten your seat. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is amazing. Because the original goes like this. Mulare Rinza Ji. Dari Vie Juni Kanta. Right? So Mulare. Below in the water. Rinza Ji. A shadow falls. Dari Vie. Up on a bridge. Jungi Kanda, a monk is going. Just sort of narrative setting out what's happened. But then here's where you need your seatbelt tattoo. Hey, you monk. Hold it right there. Where you're going, I want to ask you. It's a very powerful and somewhat threatening <coughs> statement. <coughs> you hold on, monk. I want to ask you where you're going. And I think the translation of Reverend Sir <coughs> instead of Chao is because Richard Rutt was the Anglican bishop in Korea, and he wanted to be polite to the monk who was Buddhist in his translation. But it should be sharper than that. And then this last line is wonderful. Mak with his staff, because they would walk in the countryside like this, walking along with their staff, and with his staff, with his staff, King Kudum, Kari Kimyo, pointing at the white clouds. Tora Ani Pogo, not turning to look back. Kanomera, he goes on his way. And it's just, I think, a marvelous poem. One of the things that's just stunning about it, I think, is right here we can hear Zhong Chao's actual voice. It's like he left us a message. You can hear him say, And then here, what you get, I think, is the monk text messaging back. He said, that, 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 push, send, and he just keeps going. And it's this wonderful sort of dramatic um, Shijo poem that I, I just think is one of the best of all uh, in Korea. Here's another very famous one um, by Huang Jini. She was a 16th century woman. She was a poet, a singer, a marvelously uh, accomplished and educated person. And there was a guy who said he had heard about Huang Jini and how beautiful and accomplished she was. And he just didn't think there was that much to her. And it was said that he was passing by the area where she lived 
and she made up this Shijo poem. And it goes, Jade Green Stream, don't boast so proud of your easy passing through these blue hills. Once you have reached the broad sea, to return again will be hard. While the bright moon fills these empty hills, why not pause, then go on, if you will. And you can read this poem as being kind of a philosophical statement, sort of aimed at this guy, but to all of us, urging us in our lives not to be in such a, rest, a, a, a race to get from one place to another, but to stop for a moment. And, and look around, because once you have reached the broad sea, once you have moved from this life into the next life, whatever that might be, the return again will be hard. So while the bright moon is up there, why not pause and then go on, if you will? You can read it as a, I think, a wonderful sort of philosophical statement. It's also the guy. It's got a wonderful kind of coded message to it as well. Because the fellow who said he didn't care about Kamjini, he had an office in the government that sounded just the same as Pyokke Su, Jade Green Street. Pyokke Su is also an office in the government. And so she's saying, hey, Mr. Government official, don't be so proud of zipping on by, because once you're gone, you're gone. And then the real kick in this one is at the end here. Myeongwori, Myeongwori, Bright Moon, was her kind of pen name, the name she used when her writing her poems and, and other things. And so she's saying, I'm here. So why not pause and then go on, if you will. It's just a wonderful kind of lively uh, poem, very popular in Korea, and part of a TV series a couple of years ago, where that woman played the part of Hong Zi. Let me show you a couple of other Shijo poems that are sort of fun, and introduce a couple of people. Larry Gross, um, <clears throat> probably about 15 years ago, started writing Shijo poems and set up a website. He lives down in Florida. I have not met him. Um, but he's been, been doing a lot to try to promote interest in the Shijo. And here's one of his called Untitled. Rising early each morning, I let her into the warm barn. I pour oats, clean her stall, and pour more hay into the trough. When she kicks my hand away, <laughs> Why do I think of my wife? <laughs> I don't know, Larry. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you that one. And then this website is put together by the Sejong Cultural Society in Chicago. And for the last four years, they've had an annual Shijo contest, sort of like the one in Korea at the Ambassador's House. And it's for middle school and high school students. And the first, I've, I've been a judge in that contest. The first year they ran it, there were about 300 entries. And then the next year, 500. And last year, there were about 800 entries from all over the country, as people get to know about this. Um, and this one is kind of neat, because it's by Michael Jung, who's from Los Angeles, and was in the fifth grade. And he tied for third in the contest. Out of all those students, and what's great about it is he was just a fifth grader. He beat a whole lot of 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. The judges didn't know who had written the poems until afterward, when their little statements about themselves were published. And what's kind of neat about it is that this fifth grader named Michael Jones said his brother, who was a ninth grader, came back from school one day with information about the Shijo contest. And Michael looked at it and said, hmm, I'm going to give it a try. And wrote a Shijo poem, Dreams on a Lake. I'm floating on the dark lake, dreaming I'm floating on a cloud. The surface of my tan skin tingling as water dries on it. A man yells, hello, good neighbor. 
breaking my dreams to pieces. It's a great little poem. And you'll notice here you've got the nice three syllables, and then one, two, three, four, five syllables, and then breaking my dreams four syllables, and then three syllables to end it. He's got the structure, he's got a great story to tell. So here's this fifth grader, Ty the third, and the nice part of the story is that he goes on to say he went to tell his grandmother about this exciting news that he received. Now he tied for third place in this big national contest in writing Shijo. And his grandmother said, well, of course you did. You are a 16th generation descendant of Zhong Shou. And when I read that, I was looking at this news. Zhang Chou is the guy who did the one about the monk, right? One of the greatest ever. And I was reading this on my computer one morning, and I hit that, and I jumped up and ran around the house shouting. It was just, I thought, such a great story. Well, let me play you two things, and then I'll, I'll end and let you ask some questions. Uh, you're probably wondering, how is the Shijo doing in Korea these days? And some people write it, but a lot of young people don't. And there are various explanations for it. It's seen as sort of something that goes back hundreds of years and maybe isn't something that fits into contemporary Korean life. But it's also got a very distinctive and very slow form of singing. And I'll play you just a little bit of a traditional style <coughs> of singing that poem by Myungwal Hang Jini about the jade green stream. And you decide if this is something you'd like to be composing poetry to. Here we go. If this works. The night draws a blanket over its... That's one of the students in my class. And she was reading her poems and... and most of it, but it's not there. Let me try again. There we go. This is for Chung Sari, Kapke Suya, Sui Kamu Jaramak. Chung Something, if you really like to listen to it, would be something that would be fun. It's, it's wonderful the way it takes the Korean language and kind of opens it up and extends it out in, in a really amazing way. But it's not something that people would necessarily find to their liking if they're writing uh, Shijo these days. 
And so I was thinking, well, what if we did a different uh, sort of song? And I was visiting, my wife and I were out in Ithaca, visiting some friends out there. And the guy named John is a wonderful guitarist. And he plays a lot of bossa nova. And he was sitting on the deck on their porch. We were looking down over Cuba Lake. And he was playing bossa nova in the evening. And he didn't play, you all know the song, The Girl from Ipanema? He didn't play that, because I think it's maybe too popular. But I'm that kind of fellow, and I woke up the next morning with the girl from Ipanema in one side of my brain, and that same shijo poem, Chong Sadi Kyoke Suya, Sui Mara, in the other part of my brain. And I ran over to John and said, listen, do you think we could make this work? And I think it's called <laughs> They're tuning the radio a little bit. Bye. We're having fun. But get ready. See if you can guess when you sing. Not yet. disputes 
green lobsters in the bubbling tank by the restaurant door. Slights, fights, bites, whatever the cause, make peace and flee. Escape with me. <laughs> no. Um, can you stand one more? Mm -hmm. All right. Perfect. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, I did a sequence on the various mortal sins, like avarice and greed and all of these sorts of things, right? And so this is in that sequence. But I have to explain, I grew up in Cambridge, and in the summers, my family, we'd all go up to Higgins Beach in Maine, which is a couple hours. You know Higgins Beach? Have you heard of it? Yeah, no. It's not far from here, and nice beach. But if you grow up going to the beach in Maine in the summers, what you think of when you are swimming is get into the water and thrash your arms and your legs as fast as you can and then get out of the water because the water is cold and it's got surf and you don't want to mess with it. You want to get in there and get out. My wife, on the other hand, grew up in Indiana and in the summers she would go to these lakes and swim and swim and swim. Not like me. Well, we were visiting some friends of ours up in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, a couple of years ago. And my wife and the wife of our friend swam out to this little float that was a bit of a ways off the shoreline. And they just lay there in the sun for a little while chatting, and then they swam back. And I thought, hmm, I should do that too. And so I got into the water and thrashed my way out to this little float and could hardly pull myself out of the water. I was totally worn out. And my wife was looking from the shore and she said, are you all right? <laughs> Called across to me. And I said, I'm going to need some help getting back. And so she swam out again, you know and helped me get over the shallow part, so we didn't have quite as long a, a swim to get back. But anyway, this is all about that moment, but it's about avarice and envy. And it's, the title of it is What I Want. Avarice, envy, deny, frustrate, sublimate what I want I need and deserve. I need to have what you possess. Your calm skill as you swim the lake to the float where I lie gasping. Seattle, Washington, and I love when I'm out in new places, just sort of looking around, and, and you notice things, and you kind of find a way to bring them back in your recollections, and sometimes you write about them. And so I was at the University of Washington, and I noticed it was a very busy time in the fall, and the squirrels were all running around across the grass, and then they'd stop, and they'd dig, and they'd dig, and they'd dig, and they were digging nuts up. So that's one part of it. Right, this is called one for Anne. My question. Like a squirrel digging nuts up, or those crows turning dead leaves over, I go places and take poems. This one from the back seat of the cab on its way to the airport. When I get home, it's all yours. <laughs>